I'm a hundred years old. <laughs> um, I and uh, okay, great. So my the title of my topic is the future requirements of emerging media arts. And so what I thought I would do, because I have had so many different careers, is that we would look back through some very specific projects and the teams it took to put those projects together and see what kind of conclusions that we could draw for the curriculum for the Johnny Carson Center for Emerging Arts. I'm going to hopefully reinforce from a different perspective a lot of things that some of these very, very incredibly talented and amazing speakers before me and after me uh, have said. So let's get into it. So the first thing I'm going to say is not, you've heard it already, is that today's audience is looking for experiences. I will say that most of my career has been in entertainment, so the kind of the context for this talk is in entertainment. And um, many of you may have read The Experience Economy. How many people have read that book? Uh, and it basically says that goods and services are no longer enough. And um, that's kind of been reinforced by some recent studies that futurists have done, uh, specifically here, one from Cheryl Connolly, who's a futurist at Ford Motor Company, that you know, people under 35 are looking for experiences that can't be replicated anywhere else. And that's kind of a, a tough brief for a creative, right? Because you know, the idea, I mean, when we were starting in the early days of the web, you could do something never been done before. That's getting harder and harder and harder. So it's kind of the craft of how you're using these tools and how you're putting storytelling and experiences together. So we've heard a lot of dark dystopian I'm going to start with the happiest place on earth. <laughs> so I went to Georgia Tech, which is an awesome school. I'm on the board of Georgia Tech now, so forgive me. I am wearing my Nebraska pin. Um, and uh, I was one of five kids, so I had to work my way through school. And the way that I did that is I uh, had a, got a cooperative education degree. And what that meant is after um, four or five quarters, you basically interviewed for jobs and then you worked every other quarter until you finished school. It took a little bit longer, but you left school with like two and a half years work experience. So I go to the co-op office and I'm looking at all these potential jobs that I could get. And I see one for engineer on a theme park at Walt Disney World. And I think, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll go for it. And lo and behold, I got hired. When Walt Disney World was just the magic kingdom, or the tragic kingdom, as we call it. And um, that was all that was there. My office was on Main Street, overlooking the parade route. And, um, and I got to work on Epcot from groundbreaking to opening day. What a huge honor. And even though after uh, Epcot opened, I, um, I went into aerospace, I came back to Disney because I was so impressed with this thing called an Imagineer. So, one of my first attractions was the Indiana Jones Adventure at Disneyland. How many people have been to Disneyland? Anybody ride the Indiana Jones Adventure? Seven years it took to develop this ride. But when you think about um, you know, designing from a blank piece of paper an experience, in this case an experience based on a pretty famous IP, um, there's certain things that you get to ask yourself, but at, from an audience perspective, from an experience perspective, we're saying, if you saw the Indiana Jones movie, what would you expect to do? You know, yes, snakes, yes, bugs, you know, yes, danger, yes, you go first, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so it was really kind of exciting to work in an IP where people are, came to it with expectations, but it was also super challenging too. So um, it's kind of the learning was, how do you meet the audience expectations when you're translating something from a blockbuster movie property into a theme park attraction? And then from an immersion standpoint, how do you make all the details add up? So I'm gonna to try to go back. So, you know, uh, George Lucas and Sean mentioned it, he, he wrote a Yoda book. They're known for being fanatical about canon. So even though you would never know what time period this attraction was set in, we had to figure it all out. It had to be between the second and third movie. and had like all these details had to be super perfect. And of course, Disney being the artisans that they were, were, you know, I would have, you know, craftsmen that would say, oh, we're making the ladders out of white oak because that's what they had in 1938. You're like, I'm not sure that the average American is going to notice that, but good, go, go you, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, but, um, but the idea was that every artisan and craftsman and engineer and everyone involved in it bought into this idea. 
which is we're making a, a, a world, a blockbuster movie, a time period come to life, and every detail added up. Um, and they also, the other thing too is we got to be first. So we got to be the first moving simulator through three-dimensional sets. Even though now when you go to Islands of Adventure and Harry Potter, you're like, oh yeah, that's old hat. But back in this, back in the day, in uh, 1995, which is when Indy opened, it was the very first. And uh, what was so freeing about that, because they'd been simulators with screens, and then there'd be, been cars through dimensional sets, but nothing uh, that was a motion-based simulator went through three-dimensional sets. So this Jeep actually had six degrees of freedom, the back end could slide out 30, 32 inches, and so it really gave you an opportunity to create this dynamic choreography. And so this was kind of my first attraction where you were kind of like over everything, and of course I was just kind of like, from an engineering point of view, trying to, trying to decipher design into something I could understand. So I made this incredibly big Excel spreadsheet. I tried to find it so I could show it to you, but I'll just describe it for you. Where I took every 10 seconds of a four minute ride, and I took every tool that I had in my toolbox, and I said, okay, what's the relationship in terms of emphasis? Is the motion more important here? Is the off-board audio more important? Is the audio animatronic? Is the special effect? Is this, what is it that's the most important? And I created literally this blueprint, and it seemed so complicated at the time, but kids today are like, they think, that's, they think of that stuff at a nanosecond, you know? Um, but it just give, goes to show you that we can learn from looking back, um, you know, and, and some of the, so, uh, what does it take to build a real-world Disney e-ticket attraction? If you just look at, and this isn't everyone, the team was about 400 people, it took seven years, um, and look at the disciplines that were involved. And everyone, you know, amazing A-team, bought into the bigger idea. What I learned, uh, and you can, all of these amazing pieces of, of content and artistry are, are in the attraction if you get to go see it. But what I learned was something, oops, that I'm going to get to later, which is the, the concept of experience design. And very selfishly, I kind of tailored this so that the conclusion is we need Carson Center to churn out experienced designers because I need them. You know, so I'm just going to be upfront about it. This is something that I need to hire continuously. Um, so yes, I do agree with um, some of my former um, mates who said, we do need specialists, and then we need people who can do the, you know, the T or the X, but I think you also need that person who's thinking about it from the guest point of view. It's like, when I first step into the Indiana Jones attraction, how do I make you feel like you're in India in 1938? It's like, and as I'm walking through everything from the props to the planting, you know, plant material chosen to the temple that you're looking at to the every little thing, um, that temple was aged with like 14 passes of moss and, you know, uh, every little thing is adding up to tell me something. And, um, and so, tremendous artistry, lots of discipline, lots of specialists, but you also need the, the one who says, the one or ones, it doesn't have to be one person who says, here is the vision, here's what, yes, okay, so I'll tell you, I know I'm being filmed, so I'll just tell the story <laughs> anyway. Here's one big thing. We were so enamored with our programming ability for this new ride system that we thought, hey, you know what we can do? Like 10 or 12 places along the track, we can program three different things. So literally there'll be like over 100,000 combinations of this ride. And won't that be cool? It'll be like a great press story and people will go on it and they'll, they'll go on it because it's different every time. But what we didn't realize is that, all right, I'm interviewing, I'm coming off the ride, what, what happened? There was a giant ball and a snake and there were bugs that fell in. Nobody could decipher from that level of experience the kind of minute like little differences that we were doing in the program. So I don't want to say it was a waste of time, but it essentially was a waste of time. Nobody, <laughs> nobody would ever, ever, ever know that we had done that. And again, that's learning, right, from the guest point of view. Would the guest ever discern that level of, of programming in a four-minute thrill ride? Answer, no. You know, they're experiencing G-forces. They're wondering where their purse is. You know, they're thinking about their kids <laughs> staying in the seats. They're not, they're not, no. Uh, so anyway, free one. Um, 
So what, what was really interesting about being at Disney is we were always trying to meet guest expectations and design for the guest. And um, one of the things that, and I'm going to skip around here a little bit, but, I, you know, thinking about walking in the footsteps of Indiana Jones, you can think about what that expectation is. But I kind of got enamored with the idea of, well, I want to be Indiana Jones. You know, I want to be the one that's going and discovering this and, like, solving this mystery and figuring this out and getting the artifact. So I actually left Disney and went to a company called Cyan Worlds. I don't know if you, any of you have heard of it, but they made the game Mist and Riven. And our goal was to create a real-time 3D engine and create the world of Mist online and create a massively multiplayer online game. And it was really kind of interesting and exciting because you got to be yourself, you had to play you, um, which was kind of different from a lot of MMOs that were out of the time. Look at these beautiful landscapes. I mean, when you're, when you're limited by brick and mortar, I mean, at some point the budget, you know, King comes over and dings you on the head and said, you're done, you know, but here, like in, with digital pixels, you're never done, you know, so, ah, I could, if you could draw it, you could build it. It was just kind of amazing to build these wonderful, vast, amazing worlds and, uh, and, and figure out a discovery exploration activity that wasn't just shooting things and killing people. So this was a big, huge education for me. And as part of that, I got into playing MMOs and I may or may not have a level 95 World of Warcraft character <laughs> that I've digitally printed and is proudly shown in my office. But, um, but you know, I was, sh I was shocked and amazed. I mean, Sean's talking about community. Now I'm talking with people who only I know virtually. Um, and it's very, very different. There's a whole nother language. There's a whole nother <laughs> dynamic. They're over time. These things really change and grow. And it was very, very interesting. So the things that I learned is like, okay, well, in a, in a theme park attraction that's got to get essentially 11, 12 million people through it a year, you really can't give them anything to do or decide. We've got to be 2,400 people an hour, let's move it. So you're giving them this great experience, but they really don't have any agency. They really don't have any ability to interact. So now you're building a, a well, you know, massively multiplayer online game. It's all about agency and interaction, decisions, what path you're going you're gonna to go through. And now you're creating a whole new world. I can create the rules of this world. However, I have to communicate them to you. I have to teach you what it's like to be in this world. And another great th thing about making a, a virtual game is that I can update the content. You know, so the idea that <laughs> when we made Indie, we basically, on opening day, we turn the keys over to the operators at, at, well, at Disneyland and we say, go in peace. Uh, we're going to go sleep for about two months. And, um, and like, it's got to stand the test of time for five, 10, or 15 years until they put rehab money into it. But here with, with a virtual game, you can update the content uh, pretty regularly. So that was kind of all exciting, great things to learn. So what kind of team does it take to make something in a virtual game engine? You know, and you can see the white things, uh, the things in white are, are all disciplines that, that came over from theme park and making theme park and real world immersive experiences. And everything in blue is new and different, right? So now I have to have a physics engine integrated. And you know, now I have to have customer and technical support because you know, I, I didn't do the thing right and I don't know how to do it and I've got to, I'm paying money for this. And you know, there's, there's level design and interaction design and user interface design. There's all these things, character design and interactive writing. Game writing is different from writing something that's a, essentially a linear experience. So all these new disciplines kind of come into it. So just to take one qu quick step back, uh, my last attraction at Disney was Mission Space. And <clears throat> I want to bring this up because it, it brings up an interesting dilemma that Imagineers uh, faced, which I think they're solving, by the way. I'm not trying to put a commercial in here, but Star Wars um, and the world of Pandora, you should go see those if you get a chance. Um, which is, you know, how could we, in a, in a theme park attraction that's got to get 2,400 people through it an hour, how could you give somebody agency? How could you have something not turn out the same every time? And so for space, we wanted to give people the sensation of what it's really like to be an astronaut. So how many of you have been on a 20-foot arm centrifuge? I have. <laughs> so I went to Dayton, Ohio, uh, took a VCR and a monitor and had the flight surgeon there and said, hey, let's just see what will happen. And uh, it turned out it was pretty fun, you know, to give the sensation of vertical travel. Nobody had done that. Again, that's another first. A company like Disney is going to invest in something like this. 
um, but we don't have capacity with 120 foot arms, so of course we got to put 10 on a turntable, capsules that hold four people, and let's give all four people a different role. You know, I got to go to every NASA center, learn how the shuttle crews work. So like, you know, when you're experiencing that G-force which pushes you back in your seat and you feel like you're going up, let's make people lift their arms so they feel it right here and push buttons. And wouldn't it be great if the crew could work together to either make it or not? I know that's a little fatalistic, but that was our goal. That was our dream. Um, and uh, this, uh, this ride actually takes you to Mars, uh, which is totally unrealistic in a four minute ride, but uh, it was not our first choice. But there was a movie coming out called Mission to Mars, so we integrated with that. Um, so anyway, uh, I kind of got frustrated by the idea that in our digital display and the way we were pushing people through that we really couldn't give people agency. And I talked a lot about, well, why don't we use a game engine for the digital display and let's give people the option to either make it or not. And we're not saying they died, but like maybe they just crashed to the side or to the left or whatever. Didn't happen. So what I want to show you is, a, actually, how many people have heard of this project, Field Trip to Mars? So again, putting all my worlds together, I worked for Lockheed Martin for about a decade. Uh, this was just done last year. If you hadn't seen it, I was going to show you the, uh, the video, but it's, um, it's on the internet. But you should definitely look up the Lockheed field trip, tri field trip to Mars. So what they did is they took a school bus and they took all of the windows and made transparent digital displays. So kids get on the bus, they're looking out the window, they see their neighborhood passing by, and all of a sudden the windows go black. And then the screen comes back up and they're traveling at the same speed on Mars and they see it on both sides, they're passing a habitat, they're, they're, if they turn, they're turning on Mars. It was just this amazing coming together of science, group VR, and, uh, and you know, an experience that, you can't, that had never happened before. Um, this is what's possible now. You don't have to go to a theme park to have an immersive experience, um, which I think is truly exciting. I know we can't talk a lot about what's happening in, AR, VR, mixed reality. There was another one that you had in there that I don't remember, Robert, but, um, but I wanted to kind of, uh, oh, I'm gonna stay one second. So, um, so now we've talked about immersion in the real world, immersion in the virtual world, admission space, I wanted to combine those two things, but I actually um, left uh, gaming, left Disney, and started a company with Sean. Um, that said, what if we use the world as a game board, and what if, what if we could create shared collaborative experiences that happen to you, where you can pop in and out of the fiction kind of on your own schedule? And that was the beginning of alternate reality games. And so since Sean has done a great job explaining it, I'm just gonna show you one, show you a video of one, which happens to be in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most participatory uh, alternate reality game ever made, and it was a bridge movie between Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. Now, it has the advantage of there's six generations of Batman fans. I'm assuming everyone here, especially all the guys, had to choose between Batman and Superman and some ritual that we don't know about. Uh, you know, fine. Um, my, my team, we're all Batman people. So, uh, so the idea was that, you know, um, the, from the last frame of Batman Begins, the Joker kind of comes on the scene, the head of the mob's been kind of decapped. How could we let people literally be citizens of Gotham City? and just play out almost day for day what happens in Gotham City. So I'm gonna show you a short video of this and then I'll wrap it up. In the months leading up to the release of The Dark Knight, more than 10 million people were immersed in a real world Gotham City. Dozens of websites were found that built a living, breathing city. Players played integrated casual games to unlock pieces of the story. Physical newspapers and special collectibles were distributed. Text messages, voice calls, and puzzles went out to mobile phones, connecting players to the major characters. Users from all over the world traded and submitted videos and pictures. Real-world puzzles sent players around the globe. Live events gathered players together, unleashing Gotham City onto real city streets. Video and audio elements introduced players to the fast-paced emotional aspects of the film. 360 degree, fully formed immersive reality. An integrated campaign where every element worked together to create a seamless experience. At Comic Con, players hit the streets dressed as their leader, and Gotham City began to spill out into the real world. A world they could choose to join in any way they wanted, like a campaign to take back Gotham City. Hello, I'm Harvey Dent. 
Harvey Dent contacted players by phone and email and asked them to show their support. Dentmobiles brought Harvey Dent's message of change to 33 cities throughout the country. Citizens took to the streets, marched, protested, rallied, screamed, and chanted. It was big, but not as big as what happened the week of the Dark Knight premiere. Hundreds of Gotham City residents, calling themselves citizens for Batman, gathered in downtown New York City. And then at 10 p.m. sharp, they saw it, the bat signal. They didn't know what was coming. All they knew was that online clues sent them to the site. So that's just a really short recap. You can see more on our, on our site. But the idea is now you could really let the audience in. You know, now from a guest design experience, from an experienced designer ex experience, you could give them a role. And it wasn't just a passive role, like walk in the footsteps of Indiana, Indiana Jones. Now you could be a citizen of Gotham City. You could be an agent for the Joker. You could help uh, Jim Gordon, you know, um, investigate. You could help Harvey Dent investigate corrupt cops. You could do all of that stuff. And from an immersion point of view, it moves seamlessly across all platforms. And then I think as somebody just mentioned, you know, there's flexibility in how you you didn't, have to, you didn't have to produce all of the content. You could see what people really gravitated towards, and then you could adjust to what they were doing. So we're starting to see a progression. And what does it take to build uh, an alternate reality game or a combined real, real world and digital experience? Well, now we're starting to see something that's really strongly coming to the forefront, which is experience design. And I really do believe as the experience economy takes hold, this role is going to be super important. You see live performance coming in. You see physical objects coming back in. I've never seen more people happy to get direct mail. You know, it's just like, what? Um, you see, start to see mixed reality platforms coming in. What if you could go home and sit across the table from the Joker? and he's giving you something to do. Um, you're seeing responsive design. You're seeing that kind of seamless integration of technology. So these are my thoughts for uh, the Carson Center for Emerging Arts. First of all, I feel like emerging technology is a means to an end. You know, throughout all of our collective careers, we've had the opportunity to have things that are either mature or new coming up or kind of in between, and it's the craft of how you use it. So as someone mentioned before, learn to learn. You know, expect change. The thing that you worked your heart out on this year, next year may be eclipsed by something that's even better. Um, and then the second thing is know and design for your audience. I think you've seen that in all of the examples. And then the third thing is it takes a village. You know, we've talked about specialization versus generalization. Well, the reality is, is these types of projects take a lot of disciplines coming together. So my thought is not only encourage team environments where people come together and work on things, get industry partners to come in, Google, whoever, to say, we have a project, let's see if your students can solve it, but also encourage innovation. Georgia Tech has a program called CreateX, and even if you're an undergrad, you can go present to this board and they will give you money to start your startup. They'll give you a space in one of the technology buildings, and we just had an undergrad graduate with a startup in, secure, in data security, and he started with $10,000. He now has 250 employees, and his professor is leaving to become the CEO of his company. I think he doesn't need to go to graduate school. Um, you know, so it's, but it's the idea that somebody mentioned it before. It's like these peop the generation coming up who've always been digital, they don't necessarily want to wait. You know, they don't need to, like we, I call us Generation W, the generation of work. You know, we worked hard, we put in our dues, and then we got more and more opportunities. These guys have ideas right now. And then um, because I come from a cooperative education program, I cannot stress that enough if there's strong internship or cooperative education programs. And then lastly, do it just for me. Have a track for experienced designers. That's it. <laughs>